14 hours after D-Day began, the longest day is far from over. For almost three years, Hitler's war machine has ravaged Europe. Now, the American-led Allied invasion is underway. The goal, liberate Europe from Hitler's Nazi regime. D-Day is only the beginning. It's the first step, what I often call a foot in the door of Hitler's Europe. What matters most is the campaign that's going to follow that gets you all the way into Germany. For as intense as the casualties were on the beaches of Normandy, the fighting inland to St. Lo is going to be even worse. Getting to St. Lo and all the way to Germany will only happen if the Allies can deliver a constant flow of supplies to the front. Stockpiles of weapons and ammunition cover every last inch of space in the UK. But landing it all in France is another challenge for the Allies. It was all Churchill's idea. He said, when we do the invasion, we can't rely on seizing a French port, so let's bring our own harbors with us. They're called Mulberry Harbors, and the Germans don't even know they exist. They're an ingenious design of concrete blocks, steel platforms, and floating roadways. They will create an unloading advantage never before seen in warfare. It was all gonna be towed across by little tugboats and put together like some big jigsaw puzzle. I mean, it's just amazing. They were huge. I mean, the caissons that made the outer wall of the Mulberry Harbor, they're like the equivalent of a six-story building and the width of a football field. The Mulberry Harbors are assembled at Omaha and Gold Beaches. Each one can move 7,000 tons of men, machinery, and munitions every day. But overwhelming supplies only make a difference if they can be moved inland to the front. And hedgerow country is preventing that from happening. The American mindset was based around numbers, around putting more replacements, more reinforcements into battle, overwhelming the Germans. And this was an advantage of the Americans, but it wasn't always going to help you. If you were simply throwing more people towards one hedgerow opening that was covered, you were just simply consigning more people to death or wounding. Nobody was prepared for the hedgerows. From the, the air and the, and the photographs, photographs the, the military. military thought, well, they were like English hedges, which wasn't true. And uh, they were practically impenetrable. They were like walls, 12 foot high maybe, and there were big trees growing out of the hedgerows themselves. Gave excellent cover for German machine guns. It was perfect defensive positions, terrible offense. You had to go slow everywhere you went. I mean, you, don't, you didn't go charging anywhere. Very few people went charging anywhere without getting killed. The Allies have been fighting through hedgerow country for almost two months. If they can take the crossroads city of St. Lo, they will finally break out of the hedgerows. We moved out on Martinville Ridge. That was a high piece of ground that ran maybe two miles outside of St. Lo. And we didn't know the two companies on the flanks had stopped. Somehow we'd managed to slip right through the German lines. But we were just 200 of us with four machine guns, four mortars, and a radio. It felt like we were just sitting ducks. We radioed back for orders. We have broken through enemy lines. We are cut off and await your orders. Your orders are to remain in place. Repeat, remain in place. We didn't have any food. We didn't have any water. The batteries on our radio were dying. They can't reach the rest of the unit to find out why the other companies stopped or if reinforcements are coming. They do know that they are well within range of German heavy artillery. We just waited out there, alone, waiting for the Germans to notice us and attack. So we were out there all night by ourselves. By the next day, our radio was dead and we didn't know a task force was sent in and was going to try to get past us in the St. Lo. They were a large group, much larger than ours. And they had tank destroyers, tanks, armor, everything, and they moved in. They hit broadside, they hit in force. 
the task force carves into the German defensive line and starts pushing down Martinville Ridge towards St. Lo. The Allies put everything they can to bear on Martinville Ridge. They hammer it with artillery incessantly, put armor up there, they bomb it from high level. They keep knocking and knocking and knocking and hammering, and they're whittling them down. But from inside the city of St. Lo, the Germans have their sights trained on the Allies. The Germans cover the hill in machine gun fire and pound the Allies with heavy artillery. Despite the high casualty toll, the large Allied force coming off Martinville Ridge begins to break the German defensive line. The Allied task force leads the charge into the city and starts capturing St. Lo. And there wasn't two whole bricks in that town. The city was completely destroyed. Six weeks after landing in Normandy, the Allies achieve their D-Day mission objective and take back St. Lo from the Germans. But liberating the city comes at a huge price. The citizens who are so excited about liberation everywhere else in the Normandy area are not as happy with the American troops as they enter because St. Lo has taken such a pounding. It's absolute ruins. As one of the American soldiers will say, I think pretty famously, we liberated the hell out of this place. Going through St. Lo, it was very difficult. Just unbelievable destruction. I've never seen such terrible, terrible devastation. devastation. I mean, it was just flat. And I felt so sorry for the French people because thousands of them died during the Normandy campaign. You knew it had to be done. They knew it had to be done. That was the only way they was going to get the Nazi boot off their throat. And uh, you try to make it as painless as possible. St. Lo has fallen. The Allies have secured their foothold in Normandy, and the D-Day mission is complete. Now a new way of waging war in Europe will begin for the Allies. St. Lowe is going to mark the end of the hedgerow fighting, and it's going to see the dawn of the breakout of maneuver fighting for the American Army. The US Army of the summer of 44 is the most heavily mechanized army in the world, by far. Uh, it's designed for slash, dash, maneuver. St. Lowe makes that possible. With the capture of St. Lowe and the hedgerows behind them, the Allies bring in the remainder of their forces including the 3rd Army, led by legendary general George S. Patton. Within a month, the Allies liberate Paris. Within a year, they reach Berlin. Nazi Germany surrenders, and Hitler is dead. In the end, D-Day lasted not one day, but 43 days. The total cost in dead and wounded, 220,000 Allied troops, 240,000 Germans, and 50,000 French civilians. Those who survived carry memories that never fade. I'm just a farm boy from West Virginia. My name is Clarence, Clarence Mac, Mac Evans. Evans. And uh, everybody calls me Mac. I was 17 years old at that time, which the Army didn't know. I don't particularly like killing people, but sometimes. You have to think about it's either you or him. Lieutenant Johnny Moore, 25 years old, 1st Lieutenant, 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment. My name is John Joseph Hinchcliffe, and like I say, I, I was 21 when I jumped in the Normandy. To this day, I say thank you every night when I go to bed. And I'm kind of a hard man, too. Private Donald Van Rusen from Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, on D-Day, I was uh, 18. Private First Class Peter, Peter Thomas. Thomas. On D-Day, I was 19 years of age. I'm gone, Harold. I was 19, 19 years, old. years old on D-Day. Now I'm an old man of 88. And uh, 
I'm here to tell my story to people and make sure that none of my buddies are ever forgotten what they did, where they came from.